got your Bibles, we invite you to turn to the book of Malachi, chapter 1. Malachi, chapter 1. Uh, I'll I'll start, even before we pray, with with a warning. Um, We we read a lot last week for this study. We're going to probably read more this week. Uh, I I understand it it gets easy to, uh, uh, especially in the afternoon service, we we get a little weary, uh, some of us. Uh, like I said this morning, kind of overdo it, uh, and I'm probably the worst of us. Uh, it makes us a little tired in the afternoon, so I figure I'd give you a warning now. We're going to do a lot of reading, uh, but I find it to be very necessary. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to tax your patience for no reason. Uh, so as we read a lot, I encourage you to follow along with us and to, uh, to, to pay attention to the words of Scripture. Uh, before we would read, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come to you today, and we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us and, and poured out on us. We thank you so much for your word and how wonderful it is. Please help us to understand it this afternoon. And, and, and Lord, I ask that you would help me, uh, that I w- would not come across in a confusing manner, uh, that I would not uh, misteach your word, that I would not misunderstand it or mishandle it, uh, but would treat them with the, the due respect that your holy scriptures are, are due and, and uh, would be able to teach them in an effective manner, in a manner that could be understood, that could edify your church. Uh, not me, uh, not, not certainly not me whatsoever, uh, but that you would receive all honor and glory, that, that the church would be lifted up, that they would be uh, built up and edified, uh, that they could have a greater understanding of the redemptive work that you have done, and we could grow ever more thankful for it. But there's uh, one who has lost here this afternoon. We ask that they would continue to be burdened, that you would continue to prick their heart, uh, that they would see a need to trust you, we could, that they could see the great work of redemption that, that you have displayed before them, that you have worked for them that they might be saved. We're so thankful that you are such a merciful and gracious God. We ask these things in your wonderful holy name if you're so worthy. Amen. Malachi chapter 1. We're not going to make it much further at all this afternoon. Uh, We'll start in in, in verse 2. It says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Now we'll pick up the rest of verse 3 next week. Um, Before we can, I understand this is a study of the book of Malachi, but before we can understand the book of Malachi, we're going to have to zoom out, like way out. We're going to have to take a, a very, very much a macro view of Scripture to understand the verses that we just read. The verses we just read are, are often just abused. I mean, just in a disgusting manner, misrepresented, mistaught, misunderstood. Uh, and, you know, to an extent, I understand why. This is a difficult passage of Scripture to wrap your mind around a lot of times uh, where God himself, through Malachi the prophet, says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And that's very strong words. Uh, but... Uh, it's, it's, again, just mistaught far too often. And in order for us to understand uh, the book of Malachi, in order for us to understand, remember last week we, um, we looked at that statement where God told Israel, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? We looked at that exchange. And God is fixing to answer them, which is absolutely miraculous to me. Uh, to to show such disrespect towards God and for God to actually give them an answer. And in the opening, really, God's answer is, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. But before we can understand how the answer applies to Israel in the book of Malachi, we have to understand this statement. We have to understand what God meant when he said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. So to do that, we got to zoom way out and then... Uh, next week we'll zoom way back in on, on the book of Malachi. And, and before we can understand what this statement means, we have to understand what it does not mean. And I think that's a, a good starting point for us. And, and so this, what this is not saying is that God sovereignly decreed before anything, before the foundations of the world, before their birth, that Jacob would receive eternal life. And Esau would not. It's not what this is saying. As a matter of fact, these scriptures don't deal with salvation at all 
Uh, it's not saying that it's not God is not saying I hate Esau specifically and he will be condemned to hell. And I love Jacob specifically and he will receive eternal life. It is not saying that. It's not what it's teaching at all. That is very contrary to all of Scripture. I mean, we could go to the book of First Timothy uh, in chapter two and, and see where uh, God says that he, he wills that, that all would be saved. His desire is that all would be saved. He gave himself a ransom. For all, that it is his desire for all to be saved. It was his desire for Esau to have eternal life. And we find that before they were born, that God decreed something to take place. It was not salvation. It has nothing to do with that at all. But what it is certainly is a declaration of God's sovereignty. That's something that we can not get around. Um, the, the, the idea of sovereignty, is, uh, it, it's, it can be a little tough to wrap our minds around because and I'll, I'll have to reference this doctrine of or this this viewpoint several times this afternoon the the, uh, the reformed theology or the calvinistic theology uh, they don't really like to be called calvinist they prefer to be called reformed uh, but that'll be okay they get offended all the time anyway so i'm sure they'll be all right uh, in their viewpoint uh that the sovereignty of god they they really love to talk about that but they misunderstand it and and on the opposite side of that the sovereignty of god is very intimidating and something that a lot of people will shy away from they'll say certainly that uh we sing the song uh he's on the throne the lord's on the throne the, the lord is is over all he he controls all things we have no problem saying this but when we think about what we're saying it's it gets a little hairy it gets a little confusing. We say that the Lord is in control of all things. And then we, we stop and we think about lost people being saved. Was the Lord in control of if a lost person is saved or not? Uh, does he exclude some and include others because he's in control? No, certainly he does not. I'm not teaching that at all. But whenever we start to think of the sovereignty of God, it can get a little hairy. It gets a, a little confusing but it is such a, a beautiful attribute of God. He is sovereign. He is in control. And mankind is responsible. Mankind is still accountable to things. God is in control. And mankind is accountable. And we've got to, to be able to balance these things. And in order to do so this afternoon, we're going to have to read a lot of scripture to do it. Uh, now, now it, it, this, these verses have already said it has nothing to do with a personal Salvation, but it has everything to do with the work of salvation. Whenever we talk about salvation, we can get really guilty of just talking about the end without talking about the means. And what I mean by that is we present the gospel that Jesus Christ died to save sinners, uh, that he paid the sin debt you owe, and he was crucified, that he raised from the dead to overcome death on the earth. It's a fantastic message of the gospel, but that's the end of it. There was a, a whole line of things that led up to that, and it's the most beautiful story ever. It is the most incredible thing to have ever taken place, but we ignore 90% of the work of salvation and just look to the end, and that's a shame because the working of it is so beautiful. And so we'll spend some time looking at that this afternoon, really what he's referring to in loving Jacob and hating Esau is that redemptive work. It's the whole plan of salvation. So in order for us to understand scripture, in order for us to get the gospel, the Christian message, we must understand the Jewishness of scripture. Uh, for for a, a, a little time, even after uh, the, the ascension of Christ, that Christianity was viewed kind of as a subsect of Judaism. It, it was kind of under Judaism, and, and the two were kind of related. The Roman government thought the two were related. Christians thought the two were related. The Jews, uh, they were both Jews. As one believed one thing and one believed another. The two religions are very closely tied together because it is, it is through the Jewish nation that the Savior came. It was through the, the Jewish law given by the Jewish God we, that, that we worship. It, the, the two are very much tied together so in order for us to comprehend scripture we have to understand that scripture came through the jewish nation the messiah came through the jewish nation the things that we read of are jewish when we go to the new testament it's still very much jewish we have to understand 
how God has worked. And the fact of the matter is, is that God has loved Jacob. What does that mean? How has he loved Jacob? It is through him that the, that the Jews progressed. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. And go ahead and buckle up because uh, we're just going to go through the chapter. Now, as we go through the chapter, we, we will stop along the way. It won't just be a 33-verse uh, reading. Uh, but we are going to cover it, and, and I, I, I want to make this very clear. In order for us to properly go through the book of Rome, or the chapter nine of Romans. It would take weeks, weeks and months, actually. Uh, just for comparison, I mean, we're in, we're in first John and it took us, uh, I don't even know how long to get through the 10 verses. I mean, it would take us that long or longer to properly go through Romans chapter nine. And I have a few minutes, uh, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything there. I'm not going to be able, we're not going to be able to touch every single statement in the book of Romans nine. Uh, that's that's just because we simply cannot. Um, certainly, if you have any questions about Romans 9 afterwards, I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, you may get an I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll look at that for you. Uh, but Romans 9, we'll begin in verse 1. Um, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers and, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Now, to start the chapter... Uh, Paul is he, he is reflecting on his Jewish brethren, and he would even make this this, this incredible statement how, how that he would wish himself accursed of God for his brethren's sake, according to the flesh. He's speaking of this Jewish nation, and he describes who these people are, his kinsmen according to the flesh. Keep in mind, if this seems off topic to you, if it seems why would I want to learn about Judaism, what does that matter to me? He's writing to Gentiles. Romans 9 is a Gentile book. It's the believers at Rome. And he spends so much of the book of Romans, so much of the book of Romans, talking about Judaism. I mean, in chapter, in chapter 2, it's just about all about Judaism. Chapter 3, chapter 4, all about Judaism. Chapter 5, he kind of gets off. Chapter 6, Judaism. Chapter 7, Judaism. It's all Judaism, and he's writing to Gentiles. This is really important because it unfolds the entire work of redemption. And he speaks of these Jews, and he says in verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. This is the thing that God, God gave the Jews these things, the Israelites. They were given adoption. That was God's people. They were chosen of God. They were given the glory, the covenants, the law, the service, who's our fathers. Even concerning the flesh, Christ came. Through the, this very same nation, the Savior of the world would come. It was promised to them specifically, not to other people. We weren't looking for the Messiah to come, for instance, through the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. We weren't waiting for the Messiah to come through the Ishmaelites, the half-brother of Isaac. We weren't waiting for that. We weren't expecting the Messiah to come out of any of the descendants of some of the European nations or the Native Americans or the Russians or the Indians or the South Americans or this or that. We're specifically through the Jewish line, according to the flesh, Christ came. Um, we would go in, uh, in verse 6. It says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, in order for us to understand the statement up to this point in the book of Romans, he is speaking of salvation by grace through faith and how that the Jews are not getting that, that they're seeking salvation by works and they're not going to achieve it. 
So they are not going to be partakers of the benefits. They won't receive eternal life. They, they, they will not be saved. All these grand promises promised to Israel, they're missing out on it. And he says it is not as though the word of God has taken an effect. It's not that all these promises and all the covenants and all the laws that they're worthless. It says, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What that means is that there's a bunch of Israel in the flesh. But they're not seeking God by faith. And since they're not seeking God by faith, they are not true Jews. They are not Israel indeed. They're just Israel by the flesh. Verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, for they are all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And I'll give you a bit of a sneak peek. What, we're, what, we, what he's trying to describe in Romans 9 is why is it that not all Jews will be saved? Why is that the case? And he says the promise isn't given to all the, all the flesh. It's uh, the children of the promise, the, 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 those that are spiritual, those that would believe by faith. But he also, in this, he's trying to help them to understand not all the descendants of Abraham have this promise. So he says, not just through Abraham. He says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are the, they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. So he gets more specific. That The covenant gets more specific. The covenant was given to Abraham, but Ishmael didn't receive the benefits. It went through Isaac because God promised it to come through Isaac. Was Ishmael just written off? No. Was Ishmael just bound to go to hell uh, for, for no reason? Not at all. But the covenant was promised through Isaac. Uh, it would say in verse 8, uh, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So to, uh, this is the very same, he's referencing the book of Malachi, right where we just come from, by the way. Uh, that would be in part why we came to Romans 9. But just as we, we looked at how it was specific, not just Abraham, but, uh, but Jacob. Well, not just Jacob either. Because, because Rebekah was given a promise, the, the elder shall serve the younger. That before, it says here in verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither have done any good or evil, neither one of them had done anything at all, and God, the purpose of God according to election might stand. Regardless, it had nothing to do with what Esau did. It had nothing to do with what Jacob did. It had everything to do with what God decreed the covenant would proceed through through, uh, through, through Isaac, through Jacob, sorry, um, that the covenant would proceed through Jacob and not through Esau. Again, not salvation, the covenant, the, the progression to the Savior. Through Jacob, the, the Messiah would come. Through that lineage, salvation would be brought to the world, not through Esau. As is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That's more of what it's referring to, isn't it? It's not that he hated specifically Esau. It's that he loved Jacob. It's that he chose Jacob to carry the covenant. Not salvation. The covenant. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And so whenever he proceeds from, from those previous verses there, I think in verse 14 when he asks this question, is there unrighteousness with God? I think there's a couple of different reasons why the one reading this would ask this. For one, it's, it's on, on the sake of, uh, from the Jewish point of view. Well, if God chose Jacob, then why aren't all of his descendants saved? Is God unjust since the, even all the sons of Jacob are not going to be recipients of the promise? And the answer is certainly not. But also, is God unrighteous for not carrying the covenant through Esau, regardless of what they did? No, not at all. Why is that the case? He saith 
to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Basically, God gets to do what he wants to do. God wanted and decreed for the Abrahamic covenant to be carried through Jacob and not Esau because he's got that ability, because he's sovereign, because that's what he says. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, ha therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now, to we will better understand these verses, because I told you we're going to read a lot. We have to read some in Romans 11 as well. We will better understand these verses in Romans 11. But whenever what we have, remember, this whole redemptive work, he gives the example of Pharaoh and how that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That happened, absolutely. It says specifically God hardened his heart here in Romans 9 and in the Old Testament. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But time and time and time and time again, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And this is where we come to something uh, which, which would be the judicial hardening of the heart. Basically, Pharaoh had hardened his heart and hardened his heart and sinned and sinned and sinned, and he reaped some repercussions at the very end. God would harden Pharaoh's heart. But it was because Pharaoh had failed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to let the children go, so then he reaped the repercussions. He reaped the judgment of God. The judgment of God was the hardening of the heart. The very same thing happened to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were off. Christ came to be the king. He came to be their Messiah. The offer was presented before the nation of uh, of Israel and the nation of Israel rejected them rejected him and because the nation rejected him Christ said your house is left unto you desolate and he turned from them through his judgment that was actually why he spoke in parables he didn't speak in parables to help everybody understand everything he spoke in parables that way the Israelites wouldn't understand this was not permanent we're going to see this in Romans 11 None of this was to be permanent. The point wasn't just that they could never know the truth. It's because they rejected the truth. And because they rejected the truth, they were going to be used in the work of redemption. So they were hardened. Same thing with Pharaoh. He was used in the work of redemption, and he was hardened by his, really by his own making. Uh, but two, it, it wasn't to be a permanent situation. Now, uh, and, and, and again, when we get to Romans 11, that will make a lot more sense. Nay, but, oh, man... I'm sorry, verse 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? And he said, God is big and strong. So then the, the naysayers would say, well, then how can it be man's fault? Verse 20. Nay, but O man, art thou, uh, who art thou that thou repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to, the, to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so then there's this rebuke. Well, who, how could you find fault in him? That's God. Who can resist God? And really, what they're asking about is why is it that God even made Pharaoh to begin with? Why is it that God made Esau to begin with? Why is it that God made these people even though they were going to reject him, even though there, there, there was going to be some issues there? And we could continue this questioning over and over. Why is it that God would make Judas, knowing Judas was going to reject Christ? Is God at fault for that? No, not at all. God has every right to create whoever he wants to create. One big lump, it says, one big lump of clay. God reached down and scooped up clay and molded Moses. And Moses was used for a great purpose. And he reached down and he, he molded Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And he molded Pharaoh from the same lump. And he molded Judas and he molded Esau from the same lump. And some were used honorably, some dishonorably. But God is the creator. And he's got right to, to use those people however he wants. It isn't as though that God went in, we use the example of Judas. It's not as though that God went in Judas' heart and made Judas betray Christ. Not at all. But God created Judas. 
And God used Judas. God knew the decision Judas would make. And God used Judas to accomplish the work of redemption. He, he, he knew that Esau would sell his birthright. And so he put him in a position to sell his birthright. He used Esau to work redemption through Jacob. He's got this power as the creator. Even And, and the purpose is to extend it to the Gentiles. That's what he would say there uh, in, in verse 25. As he said also in Asi or in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. This is a prophecy of, the, of, of a Jewish prophet saying the Gentiles would be included. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Esaias, Isaiah also uh, crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been a Sodom, and we had been made unto Gomor- made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay inside on a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. He goes through here at the end. And remember, the question is, why is it that not all of Israel is saved? Is God unjust for doing that? No, God's not unjust in doing this. It's been prophesied that it would happen. God told him it was going to happen in the book of Hosea. He told him it was going to happen in the book of Isaiah. He told him it was going to happen all through the Old Testament, that the Jews would be included, that salvation would be extended to them, and that God was going to use the Jewish nation to do so. That was the vessel that he chose. How is it that God loved Jacob? He used Jacob to bring salvation to the world. But that's not it. That's not all that he used them for. Because whenever you would say it that way, you'd say, well, so what? Jacob was just a pawn? Israel was just this big pawn in the game? Not at all. God still loves them. He's still not done with them at all. That's why we have to go to the book of Romans 11. Uh, Romans chapter 11. So whenever he says in Malachi uh, that, that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, we see it has to do with the covenant. It doesn't have to do with this personal salvation. And stick with me. Don't get mad at me yet because I, I said some things in Romans 9 that kind of makes us uncomfortable. Romans 11 gives us very necessary context to, context to this. Uh, verse 1, we'll, we'll cut some of this chapter out, uh, but we, we'll still have to read a lot of it. Verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? That's the question. And I understand what, through the book of Romans, I, I love how Paul writes. He, he just guesses at a lot of these questions that people are going to ask, and this is one of them. So we look in Romans 9, and we see that God used his people to bring salvation to the Gentiles. And he, so then the question is, so has, has God cast away his people? Is he done with Jacob? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how that he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time, Also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And so concerning this nation of Israel, is God done with them? No. There's still a remnant. There's always been a remnant. And Paul brings this up. He said all through the Old Testament, we have this. We look at Elijah. What did Elijah, what was his complaint? Nobody worships you but me. And God says, no, I've got 7,000. There's a remnant. You don't see the remnant. The remnant's not huge. The remnant's not overwhelming. But there's a remnant. There is a, still a promise, and even to this day, there is still a promise. There's a remnant of faithful Israel that believe by faith. 
All through the Old Testament, there's a remnant that believed by faith. Into the New Testament, it's still a remnant that believed by faith. God is not done with his people. Let's we'll skip down to verse 11. I say then, had they stumbled, that they should fall. And this is where we get very necessary context to Romans chapter 9. Leading up to this, he explains how that Israel fell. Uh, the vast majority of them. As he already stated in Romans 9. They stumbled. That's actually how he ended Romans 9. They stumbled. I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness and so he's saying, if God used the fall and the rejection of his own people to bring salvation to the whole world, how and, and it is so in his riches to the world, his glorious to the world, how much more glorious is it when his people come back to him, when Israel returns? It says, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He says, so if they're cast away because they don't believe, and the world is grafted in, when that which is natural comes back, how much more glorious is that? How, how exciting is that? It says, it says uh, as the way he puts it, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so also are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And so what he's saying here is, is we have the, the tree, and the tree is a Jewish tree. God made the covenant to the Jews to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. That was where the promise was given. And you and me, we're the Gentiles. We don't belong, but God's merciful and he's gracious. And he used his people to bring salvation to us. He used his people to bring salvation to the Edomites, to the sins of Esau. He used his people to bring salvation to the whole world. And so we're not supposed to be there, but we've been grafted in. And so what he's saying is don't boast. <laughs> you were grafted in. You don't even belong here, but God is gracious and merciful and he's allowed you to be here. Don't boast against the branches that were cut off. Don't go make fun of the Israelites because they didn't believe because they were cut off. He says, he says but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You don't sustain the root. The root is God. And the very same God that chose the Israelites. The root is God. He sustains you. You don't sustain him. So we don't get to boast. We don't get to make fun of the natural branches that were cut off. Uh, that will say then that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity but toward thee goodness, that thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And, if they also, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. There's a, there should be this huge light bulb that just went off. When we were in Romans 9, and we were looking at God hardening the heart, and God, God hardening the heart of Pharaoh, and God not choosing Esau, and God hardening, as we discussed, God hardening the heart of the nation of Israel. We say, that sounds mean. That sounds terrible. Not at all. It was that salvation could be brought to all. And, they, it's, and it says, as it says here, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. They were cut off. But God wants to graft them back in. So long as they don't continue in unbelief. It says, for God is able to graft them in again. The hardening of the heart mentioned in Romans 9 was never meant to be permanent. It was a judgment on them that they deserved. But God's still merciful. 
God is still able to soften that heart, to bring them back in, so long as they would. Verse 24, For if thou wert cut off, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted in to their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And this statement I do want to highlight, for I would not, I don't want you, brethren, to be ignorant of this mystery. What's the mystery? The redemptive work. I said we're very guilty of honing in right at the end. There was a lot that took place to get us there. There was a beautiful work of redemption that's taken place to get us to the end that we always talk about. And we should talk about it. It brings salvation. It's the gospel message. It should be like all we talk about. We should understand what led up to this. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you should become wise in your own deceits. Yes, blindness in part has happened to Israel that the, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, it shall come out of, out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them and I shall take away their sins that they might be grafted back in. And these verses point to a day that is coming as well. Uh, certainly those that are Israel by flesh can repent of their unbelief and be saved. But there's a coming, there's coming a day in which literally all of Israel shall be saved. That would be on down the line. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Verse 29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. What he's talking about is what we've been talking about all afternoon, that covenant. Covenant given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It was a promise. The promise isn't going away. It's not. God has not forgotten his promise. He's used them to bring salvation to the world. They rejected Christ. God hardened their hearts. And then God allows their hearts to be softened again. God invites them to come back in. And he is going to ultimately fulfill in its fullness that promise given. Now, Verse 30, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also might obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon some. doesn't say that. Not at all. God has concluded them all in unbelief. All in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon Upon all, everyone, including the ones he's hardened, including the descendants of Esau, including the one that God hated, right? God hated Esau. He hated him in the sense that he used Jacob for the covenant, and he used Jacob to bring redemption to him, that all that he might have mercy upon all. And then we get to this wonderful conclusion. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. A wonderful worship service right at the end of this dense passage of Scripture. And by no means did we cover it in its fullness but we did at least summarize it. We get to see from a macro view, as I said, we zoomed way out to see the whole work of redemption that God works through his chosen people. And in this, God has loved Jacob. And that covenant is an everlasting covenant. Now, when we look at Esau, which will not take nearly as long, I promise. We'll, we'll look more at, at Esau next week. Uh, but when we, we have that statement that he hated Esau. Again, I know I've said this, but I've got to continue stressing this, or I'm going to get accused of some things I do not believe. This is not speaking of salvation. It's speaking of God's sovereignty declared through the covenant, and that covenant would go through Jacob. Not all Israelites would be saved. We covered that in Romans 9 and 11. They wouldn't. Now, 
we have in, in, in chapter 11 that future promise that all Israel will be saved. Um, and my goodness, do we not have time to even start looking at that? That would be off all over the place. In the book of Zechariah and Revelation and Matthew 20, it would, would be everywhere. We don't have time for that. But um, not all th- throughout all history, not all Israelites would be saved. Throughout all history, not all Edomites would be lost. This is, this is the thing that we have got to stress. It's the covenant. The rejection of Esau brought salvation to Esau and his descendants. So yes, God hated Esau in the sense that the birthright wasn't for him. It was rejected. And so to, to wrap this up, we cannot, we cannot deny God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. He's powerful. We see how he's worked and how he's used even those vessels of dishonor. He used those vessels that were nasty. He used those vessels that were not good. He used those vessels that rejected him. All the vessels were nasty. They were, but, but, but you know, some would have faith and be cleansed and be used for honorable purposes. Not all of them were. And God was sovereign enough to still use those vessels. He was sovereign enough to still use the Judases and the, the, the Nebuchadnezzars and all of them through Scripture. God is sovereign, but God is merciful. And we can't deny either one of them. And, and his love for Israel expressed in Malachi. We looked at a big view of it. Next week we're going to look more specific. And it is specific. And in and, and, and the context of Malachi, he, we're fixing in Malachi a little later on to get on to worship and how they, they ought to be genuinely worshiping God. And the way that God has loved them specifically is worthy of genuine worship. We're still here in Romans. Go to chapter 3. Two verses. Don't worry. Two verses. I had to double check. Romans chapter 3. Two verses. And we'll close. Verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? This is the question. Much in every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God loved Jacob. And in the book of Malachi, again, we're going to get more specific on this next week, Lord willing. But in the book of Malachi, when God says to to Israel that I have loved you, this is what he means. When he says, I love Jacob and I hated Esau, this is what he means. Unto them were committed the oracles of God. They do have the advantage. God is still just. No man deserves salvation. The Jews had an advantage. And because they had that advantage, because they had the direct commandments, the statutes, the law, uh, the, 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 the oracles, the prophecies, because they had all these things, the Lord is holding them accountable to all these things, that they ought to be genuine in their worship towards Him. This will be the message. Walk for verse of invitation.